Welcome to the Senior Rehab Podcast. The podcast for rehab clinicians that want to better serve older adults. And now, your host, Dustin Jones. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Senior Rehab Podcast. Thank you for your time. I'm excited to bring back on the show Jason Falvey and Kyle Ridgway. If you have listened to the show, you've heard them mentioned several times. They were both guests on the Senior Rehab Podcast. Uh, Jason Falvey's episode was titled, How to Optimize Care, Prep for the GCS, and Be a Home Health All-Star. Kyle Ridgway talked about the three Ps to PT excellence, which you know both of those were great episodes. But they're on the show today to talk about a big, big issue in healthcare, but definitely in geriatric PT, and that is hospital readmission rates. This is a big deal uh, for the financial reasons, but also just the quality of care. Uh, and they both uh, co-authored, uh, Jason was the lead author on a recent uh, physical therapy journal publication titled The Role of Physical Therapists in Reducing Hospital Readmissions, Optimizing Outcomes for Older Adults During Care Transitions from Hospital to Community. So this is a big deal. This uh, has been talked about several times on the podcast, but the the one that really comes to mind was the episode with Amy Goyer. She was the uh, the caregiver expert for uh, AARP. And if you remember that episode, she said the hardest thing uh, about caring for her parents and and her mother, father, is that the transitions were terribly difficult. They were confusing. A lot was left out. And it was just a tremendously stressful situation for her. So I've been thinking about that a lot since that conversation. And this article that we're about to discuss really dives into that issue. So we're going to break this up into two parts. Uh, We cover kind of every step of that transition and what PTs can do. So it's a great overview of this article if you do not get a chance to read it, which I highly recommend that you do read it. Uh, But we're going to really dive into this. So this is part one, and then we'll uh, tune in next week for part two. So let's get into this. All right, Jason Falvey and Kyle Ridgway, welcome to the Senior Rehab Podcast. Thank you for your time this evening. It's great to be here, Dustin. I'm glad to be on my second Senior Rehab Podcast with my good friend, Dr. Kyle Ridgway. Yes. Yes, you all are definitely repeat offenders. Uh, Chris Hines was the first one, and you all are are the second and third for sure. Kyle, what are you drinking tonight? It's a great question. I'm here at uh, Cerebral Brewing in Denver. Actually, Jason and I both are, and I'm, I'm drinking a uh, I'm drinking a rare trait IPA, mm. uh, which is just a beautiful beer. Great color, great nose, great taste. And uh, Cerebral Brewing here in Denver is actually owned, and the head brewer is a physical therapist. Uh, really? So that's uh, a cool thing. So th- we're hanging out here doing the podcast at a physical therapy owned brewery. Mm. Is he a, a burnt out outpatient PT that was sick of working in the clinic and decided to make some beer? <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I can't speak to his burnt out level, but he yeah. actually worked uh, He worked in skilled nursing. We went to grad school together and he's just developed a passion for for the, the science and craft of brewing. And it's, uh, he's going to upkeep his license, though. He's still seeing some patients here. They've been open for less than a year. And, All right. Uh, yeah, they gave us access to the back VIP area. Man, y'all are such ballers. So listeners will, will likely know Kyle Ridgway is known for his socks. Uh, he's got quite the sock uh, collection. He is part of the sock mafia. But a little known fact about Jason Falvey, he is also well known for fashion accessories, uh, not being socks, but shirt stays. Jason, could you tell us about, about shirt stays for those that aren't familiar with them? <laughs> So shirt stays are a relatively antiquated uh, fashion accessory which attach <laughs> between your socks and the tails of your shirt to keep them tucked in and give your, give your overall appearance a very neat, clean, tucked-in appearance. Um, it's, it's complemented well with a skinny tie, a tie clip, and a double-breasted suit. <laughs> Uh, I, I don't, I don't want to, to poke fun at you, but when, when I saw your shirt stays at CSM, I was, I was honestly and truly jealous of you because that is a problem that I've always had, especially in the clinic. Cause I hated tucking my shirts in. Cause when I would, you know, do some manual work or demonstrate exercises or, you know, raise my, you know, hands or shoulders above 90 degrees flexion, my shirt would come out and it, it would make me an angry, 
angry man. And then, you know, I saw the shirt stays and that that's the solution to so much of, of my anger. So I appreciate you for, for showing those uh, to me. Yes. But yeah, shirt stays, people. Get on them. Yep. All it right. helps balance out. Uh, my, my tattoos balance out the shirt stays. So <laughs> one positive, one negative. So it puts me pretty neutral on the cool scale. Yes, yes. All right. So the big reason for having you all on, we're going to talk hospital readmission rates and how physical therapists can be a major role in reducing these hospital readmissions. So both of y'all were authors on a really awesome article that I came across in the Physical Therapy Journal by the APTA called The Role of Physical Therapists in Reducing Hospital Readmissions, Optimizing Outcomes for Older Adults During Care Transitions from Hospital to Community. So a pretty all-encompassing uh, title and it is a pretty all encompassing article as well. Y'all kind of hit every stage of the game and how we can be a part of that. But first, let's kind of dive into the problem: hospital readmissions. What's what's the big deal? Why is this uh, such a common topic of discussion nowadays? Uh, Kyle, could you speak to that? Yeah, I'll start a little bit. I think maybe from the the acute perspective. Obviously, being in the acute care hospital, mm-hmm. uh, and and the reason from a hospital administration standpoint, if you tend to look at this from a really 30,000 foot view is, is a lot of payment is now being tied or untied is probably better term um, to hospital readmission. So there's Mm -hmm. some target diagnoses where if that patient is uh, readmitted within 30 days, that the the hospital may not be reimbursed for those services. Mm -hmm. And so hospital administrators are really, really becoming more focused on this because if they have high readmission rates, they're going to basically have to eat the costs of treating those patients. Um, so from an acute care hospital standpoint, that's, that's why hospitals are starting to become very uh, focused on this. And I mean, bundled payment and some other payment changes are obviously contributing as well. And, and I think the salience of this is sometimes hard for uh, myself as an acute care practitioner to, to know about because... I don't get to see the patient after they leave. I don't, I don't see the ramifications of readmissions a lot of the times, even if they do happen. Um, but Jason can speak a lot more to the specifics of uh, kind of some of the data and some of the, the details of that. Yeah. Yeah. So I would have to say, from a health policy perspective, you still with me there, Dustin? Yep, I'm here. I'm here. Okay. Yeah. So from a health policy perspective, um, my background is a PhD student at the University of Colorado. I'm doing a lot of health services research related to physical therapy. So looking at how does physical therapy impact healthcare utilization, including hospitalization rates, emergency room visit rates, et cetera. Um, and one of the things that's really important about hospital readmissions is people who are readmitted are much more likely to have adverse outcomes down the road. You know, two mm-hmm. hospitalizations in a 30-day period is physiologically very impairing. So the statistics are really, really not good on people who are readmitted as far as mortality rates and future disability development. Um, also, as Kyle mentioned, care bundling is an incredibly important piece of readmissions. And it's actually one of the metrics Medicare is using to... Um, evaluate how hospitals are performing with care bundling. And also, if hospitals don't meet certain readmission rate targets, they're actually not able to share in any care bundling savings that they generate. So it's really important for hospital systems from a cost perspective. But I think more importantly for us, we have to remember that this is also a patient quality of life perspective. No patient wants to be in the hospital multiple times they're much more likely to end up needing nursing home or long-term care utilization after multiple admissions to the hospital. Yeah. So we have, a, and I think PTs have a role in, in, in dealing with these problems. So yeah, that that reminds me of uh, that. You know, your last uh, bit there reminds me of having Amy Goyer on the podcast. She's like the the caregiving spokesperson for AARP. And I asked her, you know, just what has been some of the biggest challenges for her, and she said the transitions. The transitions are always the toughest thing for her as a caregiver, but then also for her father and mother uh, as a patient. So it's it's good to see, uh, you know, you all and 
thousands of other people trying to tackle this issue. And so let's dive into this article. So you, you mentioned that there are several models that are being developed uh, in terms of how to reduce hospital readmissions, but physical therapists uh, seem to not have a big seat at the table. And so that's what a lot of this article seems to be about is how can we be involved. And one model that you did use uh, that, that seems pretty awesome is from uh, Dr. Burke. It's the ideal transition of care framework. So uh, just to give people uh, an idea that have not seen this article yet, which I highly recommend, there's a great uh, figure in this article that basically has a bridge and two ends of the bridge. One end is the hospital and then the other end is a community. And there's all these steps that we can be a part of from the hospital all the way out you know, to when the patient is discharged in the community. I'll go through those real quick and we'll just kind of break down each one and just talk about some of the big points uh, uh, for each that would be useful for, for people, you know, like you and me. So the first one is discharge planning, uh, in the hospital. There's complete communication of information. There's availability, timeliness, clarity, and organization of information. There's medical or medication safety. There's education of patients to promote self-management. There's advanced care planning and then coordinating care among team members monitoring and managing symptoms after discharge. And then lastly is the outpatient follow-up. So lots of steps there, lots of uh, uh, interactions that could make things go wonderfully or terribly. So let's, let's start with uh, Kyle. So let's talk about discharge planning because, you know, you're, you're in that setting. You're uh, in, in the acute care hospital. Uh, right now, as it stands in your job, what does discharge planning look like for you, Kyle? What's the process yeah. of it? Yeah, for, for me, um, you know, I work at University of Colorado Hospital, and we're, we're pretty blessed in that, um, you know, people are really actively seeking our input when it comes to discharge planning. Mm-hmm. I mean, almost to the point of if there's any question about the discharge, it immediately is what what is PT saying about where this person should go next? So, you know, the first thing I have to say is that I'm remarkably lucky in that regard and that my physician, nursing, case management, social work colleagues are very much calling upon us to contribute. Mm. Um, you know, so so for me, I'm lucky in that not only is that there, but people are demanding that of us. And I think if we talk about this ideal um, construct, this ideal model or process that we're talking about is that discharge planning should start as soon as the patient is admitted. Mm. As soon as that patient is admitted, based on diagnosis, previous level of function, uh, all the other factors that go into where the patient should go next, home environment, all the stuff that acute care therapists are very, very good at, that process has to start early. And obviously, physical therapists have a remarkably uh, big role to play in this. And I would say most acute care therapists would, have, would say that, that one of their biggest roles is recommending what the next discharge location is. Yeah. Um, but I think what's interesting is that many therapists probably don't realize how important and how powerful and how necessary that recommendation is, but also how important it is that we advocate and communicate and set up that discharge location. Mm-hmm. So there was a really nice manuscript that, uh, looking at some data that illustrated that, you know, if the discharge, actual discharge location of the patient was mismatched, um, to what the therapist recommended, that patients were had a were three times more likely, or had a three times higher rate of being readmitted to the hospital. Oh my gosh! <laughs> so in other, in other words, crazy. If you recommend something, the patient doesn't get that level of care, or rehabilitation, intensity that they need. They're three times more likely to come back to the hospital. Mm-hmm. And I mean that that sentence alone has gotten at least in our hospital, a lot of buy-in from administrators, social workers, case managers, because of how salient the readmission numbers are. Mm -hmm. Uh, So our assessments appear to be highly important, but also they need to be fulfilled. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that's part of the discharge planning that does tie into another part of the manuscript, which is that complete communication, which Mm -hmm. is it just doesn't end at recommending a discharge location that opens the door to a conversation of how do we make that happen because that becomes very challenging for a lot of patients yeah so in in a let's say a typical acute care setting um which which, you know i don't know if you have experience with that or not or uh, i'm sure you've talked to several other therapists in different hospitals when does discharge 
planning normally begin? You know, I think that's a great question, and it's really, I would say, probably complicated and variable, but it depends mm-hmm. on the hospital, it depends on the unit, and it depends on the involvement of people who really put discharge planning at the, uh, in the focus of what they do. So I'll give you a couple of examples. So if you take, like, a, we have a, a, a geriatric specialty unit, an ACU, mm-hmm. unit, a acute care for the elderly. So they have daily round, interdisciplinary rounds, and one of the main topics of conversation is what is the discharge location? Mm. So that happens from the time of admission. Awesome. Now, in other units where maybe the focus isn't there, other hospitals where there's not as much interdisciplinary collaboration, the discharge planning could really be the last thing on the to-do list. It's like, well, my goodness, we've treated the patient, their physiology is correct, we have a good medical plan. Well, now where do we send them? Yeah. Then you get that 430 page to come down and see the patient. You say this patient really should probably go to a sniff, but now they have insurance problems or in the hospital for two more days. Maybe they develop complications. So, like, the ramifications of this delayed discharge planning is, is huge. Mm. Um, but the other piece is the, is the engagement of the patient and the caregiver. So this yes. ideal model engages all stakeholders, not just interdisciplinary, but at the patient level as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because that makes these plans actually able to be followed through on. Because if I recommend a skilled nursing facility, subacute rehab, something like that, but the patient doesn't understand why that's important or the family doesn't, they may actually refuse that placement, mm. which is absolutely their right. Yeah. Uh, but that's, again, a problem of communication and planning, yeah. especially when it's late in the game and patients have expected to go home. Yeah. And it hasn't been that proactive, engaged process of, of getting them ready to yeah i've I've had uh several patients where they you know their hospitals stay uh, many of them you know may have sat at the edge of bed they may have done you know just a stand pivot sit transfer to a bedside commode and their function wasn't necessarily addressed but then they were going to be discharged home and when they get up to you know, get going and they realize that they can't walk as well as they did before the hospital, you know, right before they're getting ready to leave. Sometimes, you know, when the caregivers are there to pick them up, everyone's like, oh crap, what do we, what do we do now? We got, we got to make a change of plans. So it, it is interesting to see the variability for sure of the discharge planning, but uh, I've definitely seen from the back end, the importance of getting all parties involved. um, Like you mentioned, for sure. Yeah, and I'm sure Jason so, has something to say in this regard. Yeah. Yeah, since we're sitting right next to each other and I'm putting my hand up next to Kyle. <laughs> uh, I mean, so, so there is a couple of things. So, so Kyle really nailed the, the discharge planning piece. The PTs are invaluable in that. And I think that's one of the roles that's kind of universally recognized as something that PT is the strongest at in the acute care setting. Mm -hmm. Um, But I really want to emphasize that I think PTs in the hospital are more than just a discharge recommendation. And I think sometimes that is kind of considered the, the crux of their role. Whereas I think there's a lot of other information that PT provides about trajectory of recovery and um, some other nuances of the rehabilitation process that are kind of, undervalued. Um, Mm. And likewise, I think a lot of that information is lost in the transition between acute care and community settings. If you look at the physician literature, about approximately 3% of hospital discharges include synchronous communication. So physician to physician talking to each other at the same time on the phone, by text message, et cetera, which I find very low. Mm -hmm. And for some patients, maybe a written note is enough. But there's probably very high-risk patients that are likely to be readmitted that maybe a phone call conversation between acute care PTs or acute care physicians Mm -hmm. would be really helpful to really bridge the gap between the hospital and the community. And I don't know how often that happens. And I'll tell you from pilot data from other studies that Kyle and I are working on that the, the propensity of communication between the hospital and community settings between PTs that is synchronous and direct is very low. Mm-hmm. And that's not any fault of either one of those parties. It's just the way the system and productivity standards are set up yeah. at this point. Yeah. So I, I think those are the important things. Yeah. And I think that's a good segue into that, that complete communication of information that step two on the ideal transition of care. And one stat that you all had in there that just blew my mind was that 26 percent of discharge summaries from a hospital 
had descriptions of a patient's physical function. Only 26% of those discharge summaries, and, and I'm just speaking on, on behalf of the home health physical therapist, uh, that, that makes the job you know, rather difficult in terms of understanding where a person was before, where they are now, and, and just the, the whole influence that has on the plan of care. Um, so what, Jason, what recommendations do you have in terms of, uh, you know, just kind of completing this communication gap between, uh, these, these different settings? So, yeah, so, I mean, that is a, that's a good question and one that's really complicated to answer. But Mm -hmm. what I'll say is that, you know, information about function is often lost in the transition between hospital and community. And, you know, that's for a myriad of reasons. Some of the reasons are that PT notes are written in wording and language that isn't super interpretable for a physician. So Mm. it's not clear to them what the real concerns are. Some of it is that um, physicians uh, don't have access to that information really readily in an EMR. The EMR isn't set up for them to really be able to put that information in there. They may Mm. not understand, you know, kind of the the gravity of a functional disability in relation to somebody that's being discharged with heart failure. Heart failure medications and education are considered very important, but muscle strength and shortness of breath are often very common complications of heart failure as well that aren't Mm -hmm. communicated well with the other settings. Um, So I think that's uh, one of the main issues. Now, how to solve that, you know, is is tricky, but my my suggestion in the article, and I and I think I stand by this mm-hmm. as I thought about it more, is having PT involved in the EMR documentation process as far as developing standard templates, things that maybe what what information is most important to automatically generate in the discharge summaries, so that both physicians and then the the receiving clinicians on the other end, be it in home health or SNF, have a strong understanding of not just the medical issues that happened in the hospital, but also the functional issues, which are strong predictors of hospital readmission and and very undervalued as far as readmission risk factors. So maybe PTs with their expert knowledge of function can help develop templates that that really look at the highest risk for readmissions and get that information to physicians, get that information and discharge summaries, and make sure that the next level of care is getting those things. Yeah. Now, and then the question is, what information do we provide? Do we provide information about ADL function and independence as as looked at with things like AMPAC? Those information, that information is very valuable but it provides different information than objective measures of physical performance, you know, mm-hmm. and, the, and the risk stratification is very different for both of those values. So what information is most important to provide? You know, that's something that PTs really need to study and, and have a really strong voice and what measures should we use going forward that really tell physicians and the next level of care, what is this person's risk of readmissions and how do we appropriately and, and uh, you know, adequately address their needs? Yeah. Yeah, that is a good point. And, and what would be included in that template, like you mentioned, that that is something to definitely uh, look into. I know you did mention, I believe you mentioned gate speed in there, if I recall. Um, so I'll, I'll give a shout out to Rachel Walton Mao with the gate speed app, which I've been using like crazy lately, which I love. Um, let's, let's go to the next section. So availability, timeliness, clarity, and organization of information. So I really wasn't aware of issues, uh, in terms of the availability and timeliness. Uh, Kyle, could you speak to this from the acute care side of things in terms of, uh, you know, with discharge planning? Yeah, absolutely. Um, You know, just from, you know, my observations and and my sense, uh, even before we got into this manuscript, is some of the things that we document in acute care um, as physical therapists specifically, but some of the other professions generally, are really, really hard to find. So, I mean, the availability of it is it's, you have to know where it lives and you have to go searching for it. Um, So to to give you an example, uh, you know, we have uh, one of the bigger EMRs in the country is the one that we use at our hospital and we we document in flow sheets primarily, Mm -hmm. which are kind of like beefed up Excel spreadsheets where each cell either has certain constraints on the data you can enter, it's a free text cell or it's a scale. Uh, and then we pull over 
a note that has some automatic data pulled from the EMR and we can modify it a little bit mm. into kind of the classic note section of the chart. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily include really important functional measures or necessarily all the salient information for all the stakeholders who may engage with our notes. Mm. And so it can be really hard to actually find this information if it's documented at all. Um, you know, the other thing, issue is as far as the way that it's like organized and presented is sometimes when hospitals, when rehab departments, when different services, different units are building documentation, flow sheets or templates is they're not engaging all the stakeholders to make sure that the organization is both clear, um, but also useful for not just the person writing it, but for all the people who are going to be engaging with it. Mm -hmm. And that's just Mm -hmm. acutely in the hospital. Yeah. But we also need to engage those people who may, may be and should be engaging with that documentation outside of the hospital, right? So community yeah. physicians, community therapists, um, payer sources, things like this. Um, and, you know, and from my perspective, the things that we document are timely. But I can know, and I know you can speak to this and Jason can speak to this, when you're a home health provider, you know, do you get that documentation in a clear, organized, timely fashion? <laughs> and I, my sense is, and, and what we found, and what I know Jason and you can speak to is, the answer is probably absolutely not, right? Yeah, right. And so capturing data is really important, right? And I kind of think about climbing a staircase here. you got to capture the right information. Mm. But then you need to document it. But then it needs to be available to the relevant parties. It needs to be relevant to them in a timely fashion. It has to be presented in a clear and organized fashion, or else it's not usable. Yeah. So you can have a breakdown at any level of that um, chain of events uh, or process. And to Jason's point earlier, that's why it's really important that we look at what we should be measuring, but we're also involved and at the table when they're talking about building EMR templates, when they're talking about building discharge summaries. And it's really important that we engage these other stakeholders to ensure that we're using language and communicating things in a way that are meaningful and understandable to them, Mm. which means we've got to know how physicians structure things, how they write, how they read, uh, and how they understand all this stuff. Um, Because the one thing that I've observed and heard from my acute care colleagues at other hospitals is physicians don't understand our notes. And, And I would say that that is on us to be proactive in how we organize and communicate information about physical function, yeah. about, um, you know, vital signs, about discharge wrecks, about prognostication. We need to get much, much better at that mm. so that we're speaking the language of everyone else engaging with our, with yeah. our, uh, with our uh, information and data. Uh, yeah. And I, I'm sure Jason can speak to the, the after-hospital piece of, at the transition level, what needs to happen when that patient goes to another level of care when they go to the community. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, just to, just to add in a couple things, like one of the studies that I'm working on now is doing some interviews with acute care therapists and home health therapists and, and talking to them about, you know, what are some of the issues and breakdowns in communication that, that occur? And a lot of it is timeliness. Like, when do they have information? And, and the phrase I hear a lot from these clinicians is they're going in, quote unquote, blind, mm-hmm. you know, with, with patients, which I find incredibly concerning, given that a lot of these patients have very complicated medical issues, you know, with SNF admissions reducing and home health admissions increasing, home health patients are becoming incredibly more complex. And imagine going into somebody's house having no idea besides deconditioned from recent hospital stay, needs PT, <laughs> you have that. Yeah. And, and you, can, you probably can say that you've seen that before. I have as well. Yeah. And that really puts both patients and providers in tough situations. Yes, I would agree. And that happens quite frequently. Uh, I had two evals today where that was the case. And all I kept thinking about was was all the wise words that Kyle Ridgway gave me when I talked to him during our podcast <laughs> and basically function as an acute care uh, physical therapist. Just, uh, yeah, being very, um, I, I guess I would say conservative, um, but just really uh, not assuming anything. And and yeah, it's 
it does create quite the problem, especially when you establish a plan of care and then, you know, maybe one to two weeks later, you actually get their medical information. Um, yeah, it's, it's an absolute mess. But there are, there are some patients that I've had that, that have given me pretty accurate information uh, just, just from them, you know, in conversation. But that's not always the case, <laughs> for Qu- sure. Quicker, quicker and sicker, right? Yes, like quicker way. and sicker so, so. is the truth. My gosh. All right, let's and, go to the next one. Uh, Met, sorry, Kyle, were you going to say something? I was just going to say, you know, I don't, I don't envy the, the situations that as home health therapists you guys have to walk into. Um, you know, especially one of the things that Jason is researching um, with his uh, surveys and, and interviews with acute care therapists is, uh, and this would be a great question to you, uh, mm. Dustin, is how many times have you ever gotten a call from an acute care therapist? Mm. Yeah, I've, I've never uh, received, received a phone call for sure. And I, and I can say I've never called another physical therapist at another level of care. Mm-hmm. And not that our physician colleagues are perfect by any means, but there are many times that when patients are transitioning, they, they do a doc to doc. You know, they get a, a physician call to a physician call. It doesn't happen as often as it should, but it's a thing that does happen. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I don't envy those situations. And I've done it where I'm like, oh, man, this person's going home with home health. Good on that home health therapist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is going to be a situation that they're walking in on. Right, right. Is challenging. Yeah. So, I mean, I'll add to that. Like I recently interviewed a group of three therapists at a huge Denver area hospital with a collective over 30 years of experience. And I can count the number of times on one hand that they have initiated or received communication by phone from a post-acute or home health facility about a patient to, to clarify or, or coordinate things. Mm-hmm. And my guess is it's not because the communication was so good that they didn't need any extra information. Yeah, <laughs> that's usually not the case. That, that, I, that may be a safe assumption, Jason. Just maybe. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jason, what would you say about medication safety, the next uh, yeah. uh, step in this uh, ideal transition of care framework? So, so medication safety is a really important area for care transitions in general, and appropriately is the focus of most of these established care transition programs um, that are out there that are designed by physicians or nurse colleagues. Um, and as I stated in the article, like physicians, nurses, and pharmacists, they take the lead in a lot of these areas, you know, and that's mm-hmm. appropriate. But PT has a really important role to add to medication safety. So mm-hmm. you think about the home health physical therapist who may be the only healthcare provider a patient sees after hospitalization and responsible for medication reconciliation or evaluation of side effects. Mm. You think about physical therapists being the only professionals who evaluate vital sign stability with exercise with patients after they leave the hospital. Things like orthostatic hypotension that may occur after new prescription of a beta blocker, for example, or significant complications from an opioid or strong pain medication being prescribed. And those effects are seen during mobility or with exertion. Mm -hmm. Um, Testing the efficacy of a new, you know, inhaler medication for COPD Maybe at rest they do fine, but maybe with activity they're really not doing well. Yeah. And, and there's a lot of mobility-related side effects to medications that I think PTs are ideally positioned to be involved in. And while we do report these things, it's not a central part of any of these care transition programs that PT feedback is solicited for these kinds of things. And I think that's, that's a fail on the side of the, the medical community where – PTs really do have a valuable role in making sure that medication is safe for patients and and knowing that it's not safe just at rest and with baseline vitals, but also with activity because patients that sit in a chair all day are probably not real happy. Our job is to get them up and moving and around in the community, and maybe we're the only people who see the effects of medications on mobility at that higher level. Yeah. Kyle, do you... um have you had much input in this regard from the acute care side of things in terms of medication? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, we're, we're practicing acute care at a high level. We actually interface with, with uh, medication dosage, frequency, timing, 
a, a whole bunch. Um, hmm. You know, especially for me as I've transitioned more into specializing in critical care, much of my day is talking to physicians and nurses acutely about medication dosages, timing, um, what's happening hemodynamically, vital signs wise, um, symptom wise, performance wise, with mobility around those medications. And, and I think this process should start acutely because if, if we're not practicing at a high level in the acute care environment, more of this falls onto the home health areas. And, right. you know, w- one example I can give that, that happens routinely enough, both on cardiac units as well as med surge and medical ICU units is you have a patient who has a previous or new diagnosis of hypertension and they're trying to titrate in the you know, the beta blockers or calcium channel blocker medications for that patient. And it's, it's, I, I always use the pendulum example of, you know, we're going to over prescribe dose it, not overdose, but overdose it a little bit. Then maybe we're going to underdose it. And it's like a pendulum, right? Mm-hmm. And we have to find that sweet spot. And I can't tell you the number of times that someone has gotten a new dose of a beta blocker medication and I go in to see them and with activity, they just have essentially no heart rate response to activity and they become progressively uh, lower in their blood pressure as they exert themselves or as they're upright. And that conversation with the physicians is, you know, it's always like, oh, oh my goodness, we overshot it. Let's decrease that dose. Let's try again. Uh, And so really our data, our assessment of taking vital signs and symptoms with mobility Mm -hmm is really, really useful for our physician colleagues because the patient looks great at rest. Maybe they even look great with a very simple transfer, but with prolonged standing, with marching, with ambulation, with some of these uh, more intensive uh, exertional activities, they become symptomatic or they become more static. And we can start that process of helping our physician colleagues dial in the right dosage of medications even before the patient leaves the hospital. Yeah. And yeah. under this ideal model, if we go back and we talk about proper discharge planning, proper communication, ability to access data and uh, documentation, then the home health therapist can carry that out and say, maybe the flip side of that is the patient gets home and now they have exertional hypertension where this hypertension becomes unmasked as they exert themselves and we say wow now that they're out of the hospital we're actually noticing that they have this hypertension that becomes unmasked with activity it doesn't recover and we mm-hmm. have to tweak the dosage okay. or the flip side which you probably see more often is the patient's hypotensive the patient's symptomatic um, mm-hmm. so this is not necessarily something where uh it's exactly like the home health therapist but it's very similar in that we have very, very important data and assessments to contribute to our physician colleagues' decision making in regards to medication type and dosage. Yeah, that's a good point. I think that's easy uh, to forget for many of us. Uh, I, I know just from the home health perspective, uh, just that we do have a valuable perspective, and we do see, uh, you know, a lot of the the symptoms that come, you know, with this medication. So that's awesome. How how are you all doing on time? Um, because we are four steps in. We've got five more to go. I, I'm probably going to split this up into two episodes. Um, how, how are you all doing? I'm fine. You're good? Valvi? Yeah. I can cruise on. Okay. All right. Well, let's keep going. So let's get into education or education of patients to promote self-management. Uh, Kyle, go ahead and hit us off on that in terms of um, what what should we be doing uh, to to promote self-management from the acute side of things. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, you know, one of my mentors and colleagues, Dan Malone, who uh, works at university of Colorado and and does a lot of research in ICU stuff always talks about, and he has a a really strong cardiopulmonary history. He's actually the president of the cardiopulmonary section, but he always talks about that when you have a hospitalized patient, you have a really captive audience and, Mm -hmm you need to use that captive audience and really engage them and educate them about what's going on and what they can do to affect that. And, you know, if you look to the chronic pain literature, I mean, this concept of, of self-efficacy, of locus of control, of therapeutic alliance is really, really getting a lot of focus. 
And I think we need to learn from our uh, outpatient colleagues and patients and practitioners who work with the chronic pain population that these are concepts that we can readily apply to the medicalized and geriatric population in that it's going to be really important, I think, to outcomes that we engage the patient and give them tools to be able to take control of their situation and self-manage. And I think the one thing, the biggest takeaway for me having collaborated with Jason or the biggest thing that I've kind of, I want to say, learned or applied to my practice is we need to be much, much better at the acute side of the hospital of giving families, patients, and caregivers signs and symptoms and things to monitor that are really, really important, mm. uh, almost biomarkers of, of decline. Uh, yeah. so t- tell, telling them to, to look at how their, how their dad is doing, rising from a chair. Is that becoming more difficult? Are they having to use their arms? Are they doing it slower? Mm. Uh, how is their gait speed? How long are they walking? And, and is that getting better or is it actually getting worse? Uh, you know, because if you think about it, um, when a patient normally discharges from the hospital, you know, they get discharge instructions. And those instructions talk about medication dosage and frequency. And they talk about signs and symptoms and red flags of when to call, when to go to the emergency room, when to seek help, right? Yeah. I think we can model our practice exactly like that. We really should be giving the patient a, a movement medicine prescription, but then also um, red flags or signs to look out for that say, hey, you know what? You might need some more rehab. You might need some more um, assessment of what's going on with you physically and functionally and strength-wise. And that, I think, is especially true from an acute care perspective of the patients that we're going to send home that don't necessarily need home health physical Mm -hmm. therapy. But it also is important for the patients who do get home health because at this current time, we're not going to change this transition care model overnight. So the one thing that we can change is the information that we give to the patient and family, and then they can be that bridge to our home health colleagues. And they can actually tell the home health therapist that, hey, my acute care therapist told me to watch out for these things, and I've kind of noticed these things that I'm actually doing a little worse Mm -hmm. Um, and and not doing as well as I even was or these things that they told me to look out for happen. And, And Jason can really speak to those things after the hospitalization. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Jason. Yeah. Yeah, So if you look at some of the data, so I've looked at some of the functional data of people when they get out of the hospital and then 30 days later and trajectory over that next 30 days after somebody leaves the hospital is incredibly critical to knowing how their future outcomes are going to be. For example, you use the short physical performance battery, which is a a relatively well-used geriatric tool for physical performance, any decline on that test over the next 30 days means that somebody's a 250% increase in risk of hospital readmission or death. So trajectory of function matters. Yeah. Trajectory of recovery matters. And so part of that is on physical therapists to make sure that the education we give caregivers and the education we give other providers is strong and really focused on the functional piece and knowing that if you're declining in the first 30 days after your hospitalization, that is a problem and you need to seek help. It's not a, oh, you know, maybe we should get some therapy. It's a, we need to call the therapist right now and make sure that we get this set up before things get worse. Yeah. And, and I think this area, this uh, education to promote self-management, especially discharging from the hospital, I see a lot of opportunity for people from uh, different fields to have an influence. And, and in particular, I'm thinking of um, the design realm uh, in terms of creating this information to where it's easy to consume. Uh, whether, you know, it's uh, charts and graphs, different colors, uh, but also I could, I mean, I can imagine even an app, you know, just a, a hospital app that gives all this information, can give you the data of previous performances on certain tests and could even have videos for how to perform, you know, certain tests and measures or, you know, how to do transfers or how to do, you know, some of these generic exercises that we know would not hurt someone, but would, would help them. Um, so I feel like there's a lot of opportunity there. I mean, Grant, it's not easy by, by any means, but it seems like uh, we've got a lot of, of area for improvement. Kyle, I think you had something else to add yeah. uh, in this. I mean, 
I think to build on, on your point is, you know, the, the, the digital self, the digitized self, uh, patient and, you know, just general societally, individually created data is becoming much more popular, right? Mm-hmm. Fitbits, people tracking how many steps they take per day. We can easily leverage this in medicine to track patients' activity and outcomes, right? Like, do you think a patient or a family member can't measure someone's five times sit the stand test? Right. I mean, yeah. I, I could teach a family member to measure a tug. Yeah. A patient could do a six minute walk on their own, right? Mm-hmm. And, you know, if you even just talk very simply about steps per day, that is such a dang easy thing to measure that may actually be remarkably important when we talk about prognostication. Mm-hmm. And I think one of the things that I talk to my acute care colleagues all the time is as healthcare is evolving, we are going to be not just incentivized, but our colleagues and our payers and our employers are going to be demanding that we get much, much better at prognosticating Mm. function and giving prognostic data to both physicians and administrators and that we get much, much better at identifying these high-risk patients and giving them very intensive care to decrease all the risks that they have. And, you know, to Jason's point earlier that, you know, the acute care therapist's value and expertise is not just a discard location. We've got to live up to that calling and give and measure all these things that have remarkable prognostic value. And one of the things is, is rate of recovery and not just absolutely what someone's function is, but how is that changing over time? Yeah. And, that day is coming where physicians are going to be demanding input from therapists on rounds with really good data and really good prognosis. Yeah. Um, give us the prognosis for this person. What is their six minute walk? Can they do a tough? What, you know, those things are going to be really important. And to just digress for a quick second, mm-hmm. that's going to be more important as they decide what the medical plan is. Cause we know right. that, things actually predict medical outcomes, yeah. which means this is data that's really important to the overall decision making for the patient's care. Yeah. Do, can you even imagine a day where, you know, say uh, there's a, an, an older adult uh, that, you know, say they, they have a primary care physician, that primary care physician knows their five times sit to stand test score, uh, that person person becomes hospitalized, you know, the acute care PT runs their five times sit to stand. They can see the comparison. Uh, the physicians, you know, in the acute care setting can see that number. And then, you know, going into home health, uh, the home health PT can run that same test and, and be able to compare those numbers, uh, you know, at, at each, at each setting. That would be, that would be a beautiful thing. Oh, it, it, it's coming. And I'll, yeah. I'll give you two examples. If you look at the literature on COPD, mm-hmm. Six minute walk test is remarkably more prognostic than your forced expiratory volume over one second for mortality. Hmm. So in other words, your functional status on the six minute walk is better at predicting whether or not you're gonna die than your actual severity of your disease. Wow. And pulmonologists know this. They do six minute walk tests in their clinics. Yeah. The the other example I can give you is um we have a big advanced heart failure program at our hospital, and so we do a lot of ventricular assist device placements and at every outpatient appointment they measure six minute walk tests it's one of the battery of tests that we do on our pre-implantation assessment on the the hospital Mm. and and the VAD coordinators are asking us what's this person's six minute walk test how much is it changing so I mean this stuff is not only is it happening in some data but it's only going to grow I think so I think your vision your insight is for sure going to come to fruition yeah, I hope so. Yeah, Jason, yeah. let's. So may I add, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was going to add one more thing to that. I know we're we're running on time. No, but it's all good. We got think, two episodes. Okay, so if you think about six minute walk tests or chair rise tests, those are tests of physical performance. Those are objectively measured. It's very you know it, it compare that to self reported activities of daily living or ADL function. Mm-hmm. Those two pieces of information give you separate but very very complementary but independent pieces of information about somebody's function. Medicare, as it currently stands in many uh, settings, only collects information about ADL function. And I think PTs have a responsibility to really push physical performance as a measure, a prognostic measure, a separate independent measure um, 
of physical function for these people because it provides different information and different prognostic information, more sensitive for being able to risk stratify or plan treatments for these people. Yeah. Sorry, Jason, I lost you for a second. That's okay. I tend to babble, but <laughs> out, you went out. So we were, we, okay, so we were talking about the ADL function and and activities of daily living versus right. physical performance. Complementary but independent pieces of information. You know, okay. so if you think about adding physical performance to Medicare data collection, you know, physical therapists have a responsibility to really advocate and 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 educate physicians on what those values. Not just what they mean as far as impaired versus not, but what they mean in terms of hospital readmission or future disability development or need for nursing home care, you know, Mm -hmm. outcomes that physicians really can understand versus, you know, higher risk for, you know, impaired somatosensory function in three to six months. Yeah, that's a good point. So, So Jason, what would you say about advanced care planning? I don't know, this uh, hits home to you being, uh, you know, a home health PT. Okay, so advanced care planning, and and I see that we we skipped over enlisting help of social and community supports, but oh, I bet let's Kyle go to that. Has some thoughts I miss, on that. I miss that. Hit on that, Kyle. But we can go back to that one. Sure, I can. Let me tell you a little bit about enlisting help of social and community supports because it okay. actually really does fit in with what we were last talking about. Mm-hmm. And if you think about patients being discharged from the hospital. If they're discharged with an unmet need for ADL assistance, they're significant. So we're going to stop there. I think at that point of the conversation, uh, Falvey basically cut off his internet connection to have an excuse to go get another beer. He didn't say that, but that's what I'm assuming. But that was a good place to stop. We're just over halfway uh, in covering all those points of you know how we can have an impact in hospital readmissions rates. So make sure you tune in next week, and we will conclude the conversation on this very, very important topic. Hit me. I want to thank you for listening to this podcast. The show notes and much, much more can be found at SeniorRehabProject.com. I want to encourage you to go there so you can join me and many others in the movement that's changing the face of geriatric rehab. Just go to SeniorRehabProject.com, click join, and you'll be able to get access to our private Facebook group, which can basically serve as your virtual mastermind group. You'll get a short and sweet monthly email from me with useful links for you and your patients. And lastly, you'll get 10% off your first purchase from the Senior Rehab Store. So all of this can be found at SeniorRehabProject.com. And until next time, my friends, do not forget to stay funky.